Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today by Marissa, and we are back to talk about the world-famous superhero anime series, My Hero Academia, and more specifically, the symbol of peace, and what the symbol of peace means to the characters in this show. As a man determined to watch every single anime over the course of my life, My Hero Academia was a no-brainer for me. As a superhero fan, I was naturally drawn in by the show's premise. In a society that worships superheroes like gods, a young powerless boy named Deku is given the powers of the world's greatest superhero, All Might. Throughout the years, Deku has fought against both villains and classmates alike, which comes with the territory of being a hero. Villains are a serious threat to society, and the students of UA are competing to see who can become the greatest hero to face this threat. Competition between peers and classmates is a reoccurring theme in My Hero Academia, but the major theme examined in Season 4 is the symbol of peace, and that's what we are here to talk about today. As the symbol of peace, All Might built a utopia where crime was basically non-existent, but he quickly learns that utopias fall apart faster than they are built, and now Deku is being trained to become the new symbol of peace. Assisted by his mentor All Might, and equipped with the generational power passed between them, one for all, Deku learns that the symbol of peace can only be beaten by expectation. The character of Sir Nidai is introduced in Season 4 as All Might's former sidekick, and someone who doesn't believe Deku is capable of filling All Might's shoes. He believes that Mirio, a star pupil and upperclassman at UA, should have been All Might's chosen successor. So Deku not only finds himself fighting the villains in Season 4, but he also must prove himself worthy to the good guys. And I think that's a good place to start here, with Sir Nidai and his relationship with Deku. He's introduced as a character that's kind of an All Might fanboy, but you realize that it goes deeper than that. This is a man who genuinely cares about the theory of the symbol of peace and, and what it means for society. He believes that All Might, I mean, at the time, like he is an All Might fanboy, though, because he really believes that All Might is the only one who's capable of personifying this kind of... To be a symbol of peace, you need to be like overwhelmingly powerful. It's not just enough to be able to beat villains. You have to be able to like annihilate them. And he really believes that All Might's the only character or the only person in their world who's able to do that. You would think it's impossible, but Sir Nidai thinks that he has the perfect replacement in Mirio, Lemillion, who became a Which, fan favorite this season. <laughs> Mirio really would have been a perfect. I think Nidai, yeah. Piece. Like, <laughs> Nidai wasn't wrong about that. We're obviously biased because Deku is the protagonist of the series, but you know, Mirio. When it comes to Deku and that power, I don't want to get into some of the theories, but I think there might be something that down the road that confirms it had to have been Deku. Oh, yeah, that 100%. That there couldn't have been any other holder of this power. And that's interesting for the character of Deku to come into this situation, and Nidai is just not convinced. Why should he be convinced? I mean, yeah, for a kid who not only did he not have a quirk, but he can't control the quirk now that he has it, so he's not capable of using it to its full potential. How are you supposed to become a symbol of peace if you're not able to do that? He wants him to see how great Mario is, so that way he can give all for one. I mean, one for all. It's uh, one for all. No, all for one. No. <laughs> one for all. One for all. The, the similar name thing really gets me. Yeah, it does. Um, basically wants Deku to see that Mirio is the right choice and that he should give one for all to Mirio. It's, it's just more added pressure on Deku because obviously he looks up to Sir Nida and he wants to prove him wrong. Going into this, he knows that he is already at a disadvantage. And that fight between Deku and Sir Nida, out of all the great moments and epic fights we got in this season, that's probably my favorite. Just because of all the motion, everything that was behind it, the way he's mocking him, the animation is great. When Deku they go into doing Nidai's his power. All Might face <laughs> still is hilarious. I laugh every single time. <laughs> and it's funny because Night Eye doesn't laugh, but he's examining it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, um, how dare you not get the length of his wrinkles correct? And he's like, actually, if you go to this one really specific event where All Might had vinegar in his eyes. <laughs> I think it's, it's one of the best Superman stories we've ever seen. Superman is not front and center in this story. He's to the side. We get flashbacks of his glory days. We see him, we see glimpses of his ultimate power, but he's in the, he's in the back seat while Deku is in the driver's seat. Yeah, it's seat. also, you know, really interesting that a lot of the story, when we're introduced to All Might, obviously he has parts of his internal organs missing his massive scar he's em emaciated he coughs blood <laughs> like the man is not looking good someone said that uh when americans are asked to wear a mask for 10 minutes half of my respiratory system was destroyed <laughs> it's interesting because superman doesn't give his life he gives his power superman doesn't die in his ultimate sacrifice he's forced to retire people still look up to all might and you still see his posters all over the world but it's different superman's story ends in the middle of this story and we're really following superboy and when deku runs up on all might and 
demands that he tells him the truth. That scene was so emotional. I teared up watching that. Just getting that history between Night Eye and All Might, that it was way more of a, a close friendship than a partnership. It shows you what All Might's state of mind really was, because he was essentially waiting to die. He thought, as especially after um, Sir Night Eye told him like what his future would be, that he would ultimately die gruesomely if he didn't take a break or you know find a successor five years previously when he had suggested it. Like he thought his fight with One for All. <laughs> all for one. He thought his fight with um, All for One was was it. Like he was going to die there. And it was only his successor and seeing Midoriya there that ultimately made him keep going. He was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was suicidal, but he was being ready to risk your life for people. At what point is that just self-destructive? Aizawa says this to Deku. How many people can you save if you hurt yourself after saving one person ultimately? Yeah, that goes back to season one. This is just something they kind of beat in over and over. Um, in, a, in a flashback we see from All Might, like he's in the hospital fresh after his fight with All for One. Um, and Night Eye says, you can't even smile anymore. How many people can you save? You're not even able to smile right now. So what good are you actually able to do for the people? What's a symbol of peace who can't actually symbolize peace? which is, you know, something I think about constantly in this mm -hmm. show specifically. Yeah, and that goes to Endeavor, and we'll talk about Endeavor a little later. I love Grant and Reno playing the fatherly role for All Might and Sir Night Eye, manipulating <laughs> them into meeting each other eventually. And that's when Sir Night Eye says to Grant Torino about Deku that he has a touch of the madness that All Might had that I could just never understand. Mirio may have this maximum potential, but Deku and All Might are probably like 5% psychopaths. I mean, Deku's whole thing with, my body's being rewound. So clearly I just have to keep destroying it. <laughs> she can heal me faster than I kill myself, essentially. Yeah, I mean, in All Might's, I guess, state of mind, this idea that the ultimate hero, you know, runs without, earlier feet move without them being able to think about it, also plays into Stain's idea of what a true hero is. Essentially, if you accept any kind of monetary gain for being a hero, then you're not a hero. He respects Deku in their fight in season three because he kind of, he values the people he's saving first. He's not really thinking about himself. It's so fascinating how Stain's manifesto still pops up. That's another example of a villain was defeated, but was he really? Because his main goal was to get this idea out there in society that maybe heroes have been corrupted. And I don't necessarily think he's wrong. That's really one of the main themes of the entire series is that there are cracks in this society that All Might has built and there's, there's I mean, fear out there. Just in how Bakugo and Midoriya, how each of them view All Might, like they both admire All Might, but they take entirely different definitions of heroism from idolizing All Might. He even acknowledges that in them. He says that together they're basically the perfect hero or they have the potential to be the perfect hero. Yeah, they're like uh, m and and Death Note. Watch Death Note. <laughs> and with the power of One for All, we've always wanted to see All Might at his maximum power. When he's fighting the Nomu, it's his maximum power at that time. But like I said, we've never really seen Prime All Might. <laughs> but we're seeing it now. When Deku is fighting at 100%, first of all, when he first goes 100%, he has no idea what's happening. Nobody does. When, when he that was... music comes on. The... Oh, that song. And, everyone, uh... and he's just whipping around and everyone's just floating. What the fuck is going on? I thought, I was like, this man broke his leg. He's like, wait, did I use 100%? My leg should be broken. And I was like, oh my God, is his leg broken? It's still to this day, as he is gradually putting it together, what is happening now? What is happening here with Eri on his back, zapping his power, but him regaining the power because he's faster than her? I don't, I don't know who's faster, but watching him put together the pieces. And Overhaul makes the mistake of giving a villain speech. Yeah. He comes up. <laughs> And he explains everything, and Deku's like, oh, I'm, I'm Jesus. I have the power of God himself now. You're in, you're in trouble. And that first kick, even Toga is watching from the back like, damn, Midori, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> My favorite part, and I've, I posted this as a gif on Twitter, when it's after, you know, the whole sea of punches in the sky, oh. which so I love. I know people think that's corny, but I love it. I, I love, like, overpowered moments like that. The speed and the movements in which he's moving, he's moving so perfectly, and I think it's a perfect use of slow motion. It portrays power. But after that, when you see Overhaul's face as he's looking up, <laughs> and then it's, like, Deku's face coming out of the shadow, and he's pissed. Um, And it's, like, Aerie's hair behind him, and he kind of looks a little bit like a monster. Yeah. That, yeah. that, oh my, I love that. He, I love that scene. Overhaul is, he's shouting insults. He's saying, you're dumb. You don't understand this. Deku does not care. He no. is furious. And it's so funny because like right before that, when he's looking at Aerie, he's smiling, um, embodying All Might in that moment. But you know, the second Aerie's on his back and it's just him and Overhaul, <laughs> he's like, do you understand death? 
In the final shot of that episode, when Deku is fighting over all the smile from Nadai. I don't, I don't know if the, you, this could be seen as confirmation that he accepts Deku now, but <laughs> he's happy with this outcome, at the very least. Because I remember you saying that you almost wanted more of a verbal confirmation. Yeah. Um, hey, you can I, be yeah, the I wanted him to. <laughs> I wanted him to say to Deku, like, you will be a good hero. And he didn't, but I, I wanted him to say it. The insecurity of that character and not wanting to use his power, it stems from him seeing the death of his own friend. So he, he yeah, can't he also withstand just, to see that anymore. To him, his entire life up until that point, his the futures that he saw have been immutable. Right. Like, he says, if I'm looking into the future, aren't I just writing their future in stone? It's like, if he doesn't know what's happening, then it's possible to still change it in a way. Maybe his visions can't account for someone who can literally rewind things like that. The uh, the final goodbye between Night Eye and All Might, it's obviously very emotional. And, and they never really got like the catharsis that they truly needed. Like they never hashed anything out. Um, even <laughs> Night Eye, like he's joking, but he's like, oh, so you only come see me on my deathbed. And it's like, I too would be that petty on my deathbed. This is real life. This sometimes happens in real life. Um, and these are two very stubborn and strong-willed characters, but... That all just comes crashing down when Night Eye's laying there on the bed. And it's so sad for a character like Mirio. And you you see Night Eye feels guilty for using this. He says, I, I wanted to use you as a vessel, but you became almost like my son. Yeah, when you see Mirio in the background behind All Might and Deku, and he's bursting in and the nurses are trying to keep him out. I have not read the manga, do not know what happens in the manga. I don't know if they maybe fix this or get close to fixing this at any point in the manga. Um... But him losing his quirk, it's real. It's a very interesting juxtaposition. With Deku? Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, clearly this was done on purpose. Deku is a character who didn't have a quirk, who's given a quirk. Mirio had a quirk that itself wouldn't have been very powerful unless he made something of it, ultimately to lose it. But because so much of the work he did wasn't dependent on his quirk, like, he's still a, a peak athlete. Exactly. It's he's, just now he can't phase through things. He loses the quirk and he's still kicking the shit out of yeah. this guy because he. Which is again why I would have loved to see that fight not in still shots. <laughs> you want to see him actually move and see some yeah. CQC. Night Eye says you'll be a fine hero. You'll be the finest hero like the world will ever see, um, which could mean anything really. And it's also interesting, right? Because All Might cannot bear the idea of if he was still capable of saving people to give up his quirk and it's not like Mirio chose to give up his quirk in any way he's also you know not a professional hero and a teenager I think well he's that's but, I think the difference between him and Deku All Might and Bakugo is he is truly egoless there is yeah. no ego with Mirio I think that's what happens when you don't have pupils <laughs> he should definitely get that checked out while he's in the hospital but I, I think your point about him being a teenager is correct. He has that innocence that these other characters don't have. So him losing his quirk, him coming to terms with his new role in the show, it's a lot easier for him. You know, going to a character who's probably the complete opposite of Mirio in temperament and style would be Endeavor. And he's also a character in season four who has to adjust to his new role as the number one hero, as the public face of heroism. And he's obviously upset because he feels he didn't earn it, that it was given to him because of All Might's retirement. And it's actually All Might that he goes to for advice in this season and this is one of the best scenes of the entire show so endeavor shows up obviously to watch todoroki in these classes all might is also there because he's the one who had to escort bakugo and todoroki in the first place we were just talking about this parents going to their kids games endeavor he may um punch you in the face but he's there at every game <laughs> yeah he may just cause a never-ending childhood trauma but he's there there's that's my daddy up there but you know the conversation that they have specifically about Obviously, Endeavor is not happy with being given number one in the way that he has because he doesn't feel like he's earned it. He can't be the symbol of peace the way that All Might was. His drive for being a hero is different. When the kids see them in the stands, they see Endeavor and they're all scared. They see All Might, they start cheering. Even All Might's scrawny, decrepit looking, he's still number one. Yeah, and when Endeavor sees Todoroki being admired by these kids, he f is proud of him. Mm -hmm. It's like a, an emotion we have not seen from Endeavor towards Todoroki in that kind of way. And this goes back to the sports parallels, the differences in leadership. They would, they would always say this about, you know, Chris Paul, vocal leader, rah-rah guy, can hype up his teammates. 
but a Kobe Bryant was someone who just led by example. Yeah, wasn't going I, to I speak totally up. I totally understand this reference. Yeah, <laughs> but that's Endeavor. When they introduce him as the number one hero at the hero rankings, his speech is, I'm not going to say anything, just watch me. Watch what I do. I'm not going to be all might up here cracking jokes, charismatic talk shows. I just get the job done. And it's a difference in approach, and maybe you can become a symbol of peace in that respect, where it isn't so much about <laughs> inspiration, it's more about fear. <laughs> Which is <laughs> dangerous. It's dangerous to sew together a society on fear rather yeah. than inspiration and hope. I think maybe the point here is that no one can become the All Might character, not even Deku, and that what he ultimately becomes might be something entirely different because, um, you know, just... A really brief mention but like the very end credit scene when um the very end when he sees the other users of one for all and what that could possibly mean for him in the future that was such a great end credit scene <laughs> it really was and i also like the theory that it's not going to be a symbol of peace it's going to be symbols of peace and they've established that with the unity in class 1a being led by deku and bakugo and you said previously that they truly represent the two sides of the all might coin so maybe that that's what it is it's the league of heroes and it's just it contributes i think to the overall commentary about what being the symbol of peace means in the society because honestly being the symbol of peace sucks um we see what being the symbol of peace has done to all might and he considers that a worthwhile sacrifice for him but to think how many more years he could have gotten as the symbol of peace had he not destroyed his body so much in different situations, which it's it's hard. Obviously, we're not superheroes and we don't know what the, that kind of risk is like. To have a career where you need to be ready to die any single time you go out, at what point does prioritizing yourself in order to save more people ultimately do? Like if a hero who worked for one day um, died saving someone, what is that compared to a long career of saving hundreds and hundreds of people? Well, you look at a hero like Hawks and how Stain probably just hates this oh, guy. Oh, 100%. Watching from the cell. Hawks was a great new character, and we see him a bit in the movie when he's doing his investigations. Yeah, that was, for us, that was our first introduction to Hawks. Because right. that movie came out um, midway through season four. Or we saw it in theaters midway through season four. And Hawks and Endeavor, it's funny because they're both very flashy. There's a difference in their style in that... Hawks is probably not a psychopath. And you also see, you know, the the ease at which Hawks moves through his, like, specific community. He doesn't even need to really look at people in order to stop crime. They like him. And Endeavor's just kind of, like, he has an intimidating presence, so he's feared by most people who see him. And Hawks is not cowed by him whatsoever. Yeah, and uh, once again, the, the All Might split here, where you have the cares, you have the charm, the charisma... But uh, lacks the, the dedication. Right. And then you have the ultimate power who does not lack dedication. He just lacks humanity. And with a character like Endeavor, I think it was more of, you know, the game is on. He is the number one hero now. He has to display that incredible strength that All Might once did in obliterating and annihilating his enemies when he was fighting the Nomus. And it was a great fight. But from a personal standpoint, throughout the season, he's carrying regret. And it's not so much him trying to make up for him for his mistakes. It's him trying to be the best version of this persona that he has created, this Endeavor persona, this iconic hero. And going back to All Might's perspective, I think All Might, if he does regret what he had to do to become the number one hero, destroying his body, at the end of the day, he is the one suffering the ultimate consequences of those decisions. In Endeavor's case, it's also his family that have to suffer those consequences. And I also believe Endeavor in this season is contemplating, was this all worth it? Was it worth it abusing your family? Was it worth it treating your son like a guinea pig to become that next number one hero? It's not as simple as him saying, yeah, I regret doing this and I made a mistake. You have to account for the other. You have to account for the emotions and the lives of the people in your family, the people that you mistreated. And getting that perspective of from the Todoroki family was, it was very interesting. Yeah. And that, that scene, you know, when... They talk about him delivering the blue flowers to Todoroki's mom. Probably the most powerful scene of the season. Yeah, like, she appreciates the gesture, but she's also not ready to see him. Like, he abused her, and he abused his children. Yeah. And that's something that he can't he is... undo. All in the quest of him becoming the number one. Again, like, it goes to whether he deserves the number one title at all and what being a number one hero means. Like, if you save that many people, but you torture your family ultimately like what does that mean what right. kind of hero society is this Todoroki's reaction to seeing oh, his yeah. dad like Everyone, he hates his dad does not want to be like his father but it's also another thing to see your dad who's now the number one hero possibly be murdered on television 
It's, it's why my feelings about Endeavor are so complicated. Like Hawk says, we understand that this world, at least for now, needs a new number one who is capable in the same way that All Might was capable, if maybe they don't mean the same thing. I often wonder, I have these conversations with you and Cam and other friends that watch the show, will there be a significant time jump where these characters are adults? I do really like the theory of them teaming up. And they, there's so many goddamn hints and foreshadowing of them forming some sort of team. I mean, I personally would love that. I would not be mad at it. It's an interesting endgame for the premise that they present to us. The one symbol of peace then becomes 12 or 24 symbols of, of peace. Pieces. Peace I. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm excited for season five, and I'm excited to see how this story continues to play out. And, you know, I'm sure that there's a bunch of details that we've missed because we haven't read the manga. But, you know, we do enough reading with the subtitles. What? Well, would you look at that? It's finally over. Hey guys, Bo Oliver here for one final send-off. Now, before I beg you guys to like and share this video, I'd like to thank our very special Patreon pledgers. We are very proud of the community we've been able to build here at NerdTube, and it would not have been possible without our Patreon supporters. You guys are the true MVPs of this channel. Everything I've said, you keep the fridge full, you keep the lights on. There aren't enough words to thank you guys, but we'll do it anyway. Thank you. And we have a few videos coming up that have been suggested to us by Patreon pledgers, My Hero Academia, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Full Metal Alchemist will be reviewed by Marissa, and yours truly, and Castlevania, which will be reviewed by Marissa and Aaron. And if you'd like to consider donating to our Patreon page, you can visit patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out some of the rewards we offer to our listeners. And really, we'd like to thank everyone who takes the time out of their day to watch our videos. Patreon pledger or not, your support is what keeps us motivated to keep giving the world our opinions on movies and TV shows and video games and pop culture, even though no one asked for it. We're still here, we're still yapping, and we hope you continue to join us. I'm Bo Oliver and I support this message.